We're going to get right into the Word of God. You're going to love it, but you're going to have to pay attention. Is that okay? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We fully recognize that the teacher of the church is not a man or woman. No, Lord, the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Here's our heart. Fill it with your way and your will and your want and your desire. Cause your word to become alive to us, not just ink on a page, but life in our heart. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor as you build us to be all that the Father would have us to be and all the Son that paid the price for us to be and all that the Holy Spirit is empowering us to be. Build us to be what you want and we'll give you the praise. We ask also that you bless all the churches around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ this day and tonight and tomorrow. There are brothers and our sisters and we love them and we don't think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one kingdom, building your kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God will give you the praise and God will give you all the glory. How good it is to be in your house this day. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Today, in fact, I'm going to just give you the title of the message, if I may. It's, it's called Angels and Demons, out of Hebrews, the 13th chapter. And I'm waiting for them to put the title up on the overhead before I go any further. So help me, everybody, Angels and Demons. I'm not going to talk about demons so much today. You might say, well then, Pastor, why did you put the name demons in there? Because I thought it was more fun than just plain angels. <laughs> and so I was just trying to get your attention. Well, we're going to talk about angels today because a lot of people that are Christians don't even understand how influential they can be in our life and how important they are in our life. A lot of times we don't have an understanding that there is even real angels. The only introduction to angels we have is carried by some Hollywood movie, which is absolutely the stupidest thing in the world as an interpretation of what godly angels are all about. Angels are very important for you to understand because the more you understand about the work of angels and what they do on behalf of God, the more confidence you have in God. The more confidence you have in God, the bigger your God becomes. The bigger your God becomes, the greater things you do. The greater things you do, the greater accomplishments you will live your life in. And it all starts with having a great big God. And it all starts with knowing who this great God is. And how he cares and how he loves and how he wants to provide and meet your needs. And a lot of times we don't understand that. We don't understand how important it is to have God big inside of us. If you're going to do big things for God or big things for life or big things in life, you better have a big God. And the more you know about God, the more you will be able to do great, mighty, marvelous things. The littler you have your God, the smaller life you will live. It's your call. It's your choice. And that's why we're going to look into this. You know, we go line upon line, precept upon precept here. We're in the 13th chapter of Hebrews. We've been there for seven years this August, not in the 13th chapter, but in the whole book. We'll probably finish up eight years of teaching line upon line, precept upon precept. Why? Because God wrote it that way. And if God wrote it that way, you should be able to understand it the way God wrote it. And it also keeps all of us preachers from just preaching our best messages over and over and over again. We have to cover everything. And in fact, today we're in a subject, of course, called angels. 
So keep in mind, you don't want to fall asleep and you don't want to go asleep because there could be great benefit in what you hear in the word of God. In your future, I will share them with you what God has done in our life through angels with Deborah and I. Absolutely the truth. You say, Pastor Jim, you mean you've had angel encounters? You bet. And you probably have too, but you didn't recognize it and therefore had no benefit of it. Are you following me? In fact, I think there is an angel person in this church. I do. Notice how I said person. I didn't say a male or female because then you'd be looking for whoever it is. All of you starting to look around anyway. Look to the person on your right. Now look back up at me and say, no way. <laughs> Hebrews 13 chapter, if you will, verse number two. It's a powerful word. And it follows verse number one that talks about that tremendous in love that Pastor Luke talked about last week. Hebrews 13 chapter, verse number two starts off with, do not forget to entertain strangers. In other words, if you love people, don't forget to entertain the strangers. Sometimes when we meet people that are strange, <laughs> come on now, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, come on, give me, get, let me get away from this person. They're weird. And uh, I want you to know something that not everybody that's weird you should not relate with. You should be kind to everybody. Brotherly love, verse one says, verse two comes along and says, hey, listen, uh, do not forget to entertain strangers. And then he comes along and makes a statement about the strangers that you might be confronted with in that same verse. He says this, for by doing some have unwittingly entertained, what's that word? Angels. So fascinating to see that some, the old King James says, unaware of angels. They weren't aware of it. Well, one Bible translation, I think it's a message Bible, makes a statement, they didn't know they had angels that they were dealing with. In other words, how does somebody not know if it's an angel or not an angel, we have our own ideas about what angels are like. They've got to be at least eight or nine or 10 or 12 feet tall. They've got to have wings and muscles. They've got to have, you know, challenging shoes and, and swords and, and hel helmets on and everything for war. And these are angels that are out there. And my goodness, if one showed up in our living room, we'd pee our pants. <laughs> and you know it. The problem with it is, is that most of us have the wrong concept of angels. Stop and think about the verse. The verse says these strange people, oftentimes that are brought into your path, are angels. That means this group of angels look like people. Oh my goodness. Look like people. It's so, so much fun because I could probably go on forever about this subject because Deborah has written books on the subject of angels and actually teach at our Bible college uh, the uh, angelology. If you want to get into depth on angels and understand it in a great level, then that would be the place to do it. But today, I only have about 25 more minutes, so I'm going to give you seven quick things of interest about angels. These seven things are going to be quick, they're going to be important for you to hear and understand, and then I'm going to give you a stories of how Deborah and I have been encountered in our life with angels, and they're all 100% before God true, very spiritual, but very true. Number one thing we're going to find about angels that are interesting is found in Psalms 148. So you want to put your marker in Psalms because we're going to be there four or five times today. But uh, in Psalms 148, let's take a look, if you will, in Psalms 148, which is back by the end of the book of Psalms, verse number two. Notice what it says. It says, verse number two says, praise him, all his angels. Praise him. All his hosts. Did you notice the capital H on the word him? And the capital H on the word his. 
What's taking place here is that angels worship God. But the point is for all of us to understand is that no way at no time do you and I ever worship an angel. Worship is reserved for God and not for angels. And even though the Bible says that Lucifer, Satan, can conduct himself and make him like an angel of light, in other words, look good, sound good, but he can't hold that position for very long, guess what? There's no way in the world you and I should ever worship an angel. In fact, that has been the mistake. Do you know a lot of times people start cults? In fact, some of the cults that knock on your door on Saturday morning is because an angel appeared to somebody and they didn't know the difference and they worshiped that angel, followed the angel instead of following the Bible, instead of following what God says. Anybody listening? And from that comes cultish things that'll cause you to be diverted in your thinking and perverted in your ideas in life towards the things of God. And so no worship goes to an angel. It is reserved for God. Did you get that? Number two thing is kind of fascinating. It's found in the New Testament, Luke 22nd chapter. Here in Luke 22nd chapter, if you'll go there with me, you will find that here's Jesus. He's at right before the crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying and he's just before the Lord. And he's asking God, God, can you just remove this from me? He's not asking God because he's afraid of the crucifixion. He's not asking God, you know, he's like sweating blood, you know. He's not asking God to remove uh, him from this position that he's called to. He's not afraid of the cross. He's not afraid of the beating. He's not afraid of uh, the muscles being poured, uh, pulled away from his bones. He's not afraid of all of that. So he's asking God, God, is there any other way? He's afraid of something that you and I never really understand. He has never been separated from the Father before. That's why on the cross he said, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Because when he took on the sins of every man, God could no longer have him any longer. And he was fearful of that relationship being separated from the Father. How much more so should we be? And all of a sudden, he realized something, and he's before God, and he's praying. And it's a wonderful verse, verse number 43. It starts off with, then the angel appeared to him. Notice the capital H, him, Jesus. From heaven. And then it says, funny two words, strengthening him. Here's angels strengthening Jesus. And here's the point that you need to get. Angels can strengthen you. They're in your life to strengthen you in your faith with God. They're in your life to encourage you to go further. You know, the word in one translation says strengthen. Another translation says encouragement. Did you know that people will only go as far as they're encouraged to go? Some of you maybe had families that never encouraged you. Guess what? You're in a new family when you get saved, the family of God. And God wants to encourage you to go further than you could ever imagine. And he doesn't encourage you so you can fail. He encourages you so you can hook up with him and find out through his power how you can make it in life. Come on, somebody. And so here the deliverer of strength to Jesus was an angel. And if an angel will deliver strength to Jesus with encouragement, then he can do the same thing with you. And with me, oftentimes the life looks bad. Oftentimes things are heavy. Oftentimes things look like they're not gonna work out. Oftentimes things have great problems that seem to linger and they don't seem to have any results. And then all of a sudden, there's somebody that encourages you. Maybe today that's already happened for many of you that are in here. There's an encouragement and that's an angel that brought that to you. You may have heard my voice, but what settled it in your heart may have been that angel that settled it for you. So powerful for us, angels can strengthen us. Number three, found in the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter. And I love this because it's so interesting. Let's go there in Revelation, the 12th chapter, and let's take a look because it's important for you to know these things. Revelation, the 12th chapter, and verse number seven says, and war broke out in the heavens, and Michael and his angels fought with 
a dragon, and the dragon and his angels, but they did not prevail, nor was there any place found for them in heaven any longer. Listen to this. Angels will and can fight evil on your behalf. And you need to know that you're not in this battle alone. You need to know that God cares about you to send an army of angels to do a battle for you. And without understanding this, sometimes we feel like we're alone when we're in a battle. We feel like we're in a fight and we don't seem to go to anywhere. And we're not alone. Not only is God in heaven, no longer is God just in, uh, in, in some tomb. He's raised from the dead. And guess what? The good thing about it is he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's doing something, Jesus making intercession for you. And then he sends angels to carry out the encouragement you need to have in order to keep on fighting. Because they're fighting evil on your behalf. Tell me the truth. Has anybody ever been in this whole place Anybody honest enough to say you've had times of despair, times of discouragement, times of frustration, times when you just wanted to give up, times when you just, you know, said, oh, I just can't go any further. I have. And then all of a sudden, somewhere along the line, here comes a light and it just shines and it gets me out of the darkness and I'm in the light. And all of a sudden I know the battle has been won. Why? It's because an angel has been fighting for me. Come on, somebody. I believe that every day there's angels fighting for you in those battles against evil that wants to stop you. But guess what? I'm good and happy because angels are fighting for me. But Jesus has assigned them to do that and I give him all the praise. Remember, no worship goes to an angel, which is number four, which is fascinating. It goes to Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Number four, we're talking about quick, interesting things about angels. Genesis, the 22nd chapter, we see Abraham. And Abraham has just done something really amazing. He's offered up his son Isaac to the Lord. The Lord stops him. The Lord is so impressed, he sends an angel back two times. But I like what is said in verse number 15 of the 22nd chapter of Genesis. It says this, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, a second time out of heaven. Here's number four. Angels carry God's word or speak for God. And I want you to hear that. Angels carry God's word and speak for God. They don't carry your demand. They don't carry your You can't order angels around. They do what God says. They don't think about doing something different. You know, we have all these stupid television shows where angels are falling in love with humans and angels this and angels have thoughts and they have emotions and they have all these stupid movies that come out, you know, with these crazy people acting out, trying to be an angel. All super stupid. It's so stupid, it's ridiculous. Don't ever think for a moment some angel has got some independent thought about how he is going to do his existence. They are made to follow God and Jesus made every one of the angels. Come on, somebody, you need to hear that. And they don't carry out. There used to be years ago where we used to, uh, they had a big theology thing about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And they would come along and say, we can order our angels around. Bull. We don't order our angels around. They don't hearken to my or listen to my voice. They listen to the voice of God. When God speaks, you won't even find Jesus ordering the angels. He says, I could call down a legion. You know, he would call upon the Father. He's not ordering the angels from the earth. He'd call upon the Father to bring the legions. Let me tell you something. You can't order the angels around, but Jesus can on your behalf. Come on, isn't that good? Number five is found in in Psalms 34. I like this in verse number seven. In Psalms 34, I I love the word of God. In Psalms 34, let's take a look at this. And it says a wonderful verse, if you will, in verse number seven. The angels of the Lord encamp around all around. The angel of the Lord encamps around, uh, camps all around those who fear him and delivers them I want you to see the verse again. 
that doesn't say angels. Can you imagine how big they are that they can encamp around your whole existence? One angel, not angels, the angel of the Lord encamps all around you. What for? Those who fear him, what for? To deliver them. I love this. Angels bring deliverance to God's people. But it's to those that... Wait, wait a minute. You didn't get it. It's to those... He's going to bring you deliverance to God's people, but it's to those who fear him. What do I mean by that? There's this fear that you need to understand. It's a two-sided coin. It's like a two-sided coin on one side. It's a reverence. It's a respect. It's an awe of God. We sang the song, Jesus, you are my breath. Oh my gosh, you're, my lungs are filled with your breath, God. That's, that's reverence, that's respect. He's your all in all. He's your everything. On the other side of the coin is a fear. I'm afraid of God. I'm not going to mess with God. I'm going to mess with God. I'm in trouble. And there's that reverence, those who fear God. He says he will bring deliverance to them. If you're a person who fears God, guess what? Deliverance is all around you. And it's just a matter of time. Come on, hold on. God's going to do a great, mighty, marvelous thing. Somebody ought to say amen. Number six is kind of fun. If you'll go there with me again in Psalms 78. In Psalm 78, are you ready? I'm going to read it to you as soon as I get there. In Psalm 78, and in verse number 25, men ate angels' food, and he sent them food to the full. This expression is about when they were taken out of Egypt, out of the captivity of the Egyptians, in wandering in the wilderness. They were hungry, and God sent them angel food. And notice what it says. Men ate angels food that tells me some things didn't say women ate it nah <laughs> i'm just playing with you. it said men said it. you know the, you know where we get this the the way to a man's heart is through his stomach i wonder if the angel food tasted like bacon <laughs> you say what's so important about angels having food that means they ate Angels have food, so they ate. You say, who cares? I don't, neither do you. I just thought it was interesting. (laughs) But number seven is really good. Are you ready? In Psalms, you'll find number seven. My favorite, 91. Psalms 91, and you'll love this. In Psalms 91, let's go there. And it says this in verse number 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all of your ways. My goodness, he will, I love this, give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Did you know that angels help you to stay on course? We are the most distracted, probably, beings on the planet. Have you ever been focused in on something and got sidetracked and never finished it? The other day, I was outside, and here's a whole tray of flowers dead in the sun. Somewhere along the line, someone in my house, I won't tell you who, I won't tell you, she had bought a whole tray of flowers, something, got a call from somebody, those flowers sat out there without any water, croaked, man, they are dead, gone. Because we are distracted people. We get distracted so easy all the time. And God sends angels to keep you on course. And the course that he wants you on, of course, is his course to life. Is anybody listening? Some of you have been wearing out your angels. (laughs) And the fact that you're here today, your angels are probably up in that section sleeping right now. finally got them where they need to be. Man, angels. So we just heard some things about angels that are somewhat interesting. Real good for you. Let me tell you a story. In fact, I'll tell you a few stories, all of which are 100% before God true. We were in a place where we were broke, which is not new 
when we first started out and we were young. I was living in Lake Arrowhead. I wasn't pastoring at the time. I was building a subdivision right outside the village. It's still there to this day. It was a 28-lot subdivision as a contractor. The people that owned the property had already got their subdivision through, their plans through, but they hadn't yet solidified the contractor. My father and I had built many houses up in the Lake Arrowhead area, and so therefore we were contacted by them, and we came to an arrangement and an agreement. For signing the contract, we got a big bonus to start off with, but there was draws as you go along in the construction industry. I took the bonus, of course, paid off all of our bills, but not realizing as a young man in my 30s that, man, I was, I'm broke. I, didn't know, I don't have a draw for at least 60 days. And I've got rent to pay and housing to pay. And as a young man, very small in my faith, with a very small God, I found myself before God weeping before the Lord having a, just a meltdown over money. Has anybody ever had a, am I the only one who's ever had a meltdown over money that at least is honest in this place? Didn't know how I was going to make it. I was absolutely broke down, just totally frustrated. Didn't know how to do anything. We found ourselves in a place that when we built out this subdivision, we had put in all of the, the off-sites, the roads, the walls, retaining walls, everything, graded all the lots, were ready to build the houses. And the people who were financing the houses in those days wanted every house to be sold before they'd finance the houses. So the owner of the subdivision, which is a Beverly Hills company, went ahead and put people's names in. Every lot had someone's name as a potential buyer so they could get finances in those days, except lot 14. I'll never forget Lot 14. Lot 14 had no name. So Debbie and I, as broke as we were, said, why don't we just write our name in there? And uh, we, I don't think we can afford it, but wouldn't it be nice? And uh, we wrote our name in, Jim and Debbie Cobra in Lot 14. We found ourselves one day sitting in the office in the village-type area, in those days, and I found myself looking out the window. I saw a car pull up in front. The car was like dilapidated. How it moved, I don't know. Smoke, when it came to a stop, billowed all around it. All the hood and the, and the fenders were all a different color. Many of them, they were just spray canned with what you would call primer paint. What a mess. I'm thinking, I wonder where that guy's going. He gets out of the car. This guy starts to walk towards our office, and I'm watching him. And I don't want to be mean to anybody or ugly towards anybody, but this guy was absolutely anything but angelic. He looked like the low life of low life. And I don't want to describe what that's like, because you may be sitting next to somebody that's just like that or worse. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm playing with you now. I'm playing with you. Don't get insulted. And so this guy comes in the office. I don't even know, man. I don't know if he had any teeth or anything. He comes in and he's like, he got hair all over the place. Just like a mongrel coming in, you know. And he walks in. He said, I heard you guys. Are, I thought he was looking for a job or something, building. He says, uh, I want to buy a, a house there. And I said, uh, well, they're, they're all, you can see here it is, the map, and someone's name's on every one of them. And um, he says, well, he says, I have $5,000 here, and I want lot 14. I said, well, you know, these people are thinking about getting out in lot number nine. And he says, no, I want lot 14, and I have $5,000. Take that person's name. I didn't tell him it was me. Take that person's name off, put my name on, and you give them $5,000. Now, $5,000 40 years ago lasted us at least six months of expenses. That's how much it was. So you figure out what it costs for you to live for six months. That's what it's worth. $5,000. So I looked at his check. It was a cashier's check. I stood up. And I erased Deborah's name. (laughs) 
and mine too. And he said, thanks. He wrote his name in, walked out of the office, started the car, it exploded. And I mean exploded like smoke everywhere. He throws it in reverse, it screeches backwards, he hits the brakes, he buzzes off up the canyon, up there, and I never saw him again, heard from him again, never, ever, ever, ever had any contact with them again, never had a phone call, never had someone say, I'm on lot 14, we sold that lot, sold all the houses, sold everything. He never showed up again, and we had the $5,000 Trust me, that was an angel. And the point being is he did not look like an angel, nor did he act like an angel. He acted like the most carnal human being you have ever seen. Second story I wanted to tell you is that when the kids were young, we were pastoring. We'd saved our money, and we'd saved enough money to go on a motorhome trip. It was the only trip I've ever been on in a motorhome. I'll never go on another one again. Motor homes are from hell. <laughs> anyway, some of you love motor homes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. But let me just tell you what happened. We were up in Montana on the motor home trip. Jessica, Pastor Jessica was a year and six months old, 18 months old. Kim was with us, our, our second oldest daughter. And Miranda, who pastors with her husband, in Temecula, the rock of Temecula, the, who are currently in Africa on a missions trip. They, uh, Miranda was with us. And there was a day coming that we had the whole day off from meetings. We'd been meetings morning, noon, night. We had the whole day off, had the kids in a motorhome. I loved to fish when I was young. My dad taught me how to trout fish, and I just loved to fish. And I, I told Deborah, I said, I got my fishing rod. I got my fish. Let's go find a place where I can fish. This is Montana. Let's drive to some wilderness place. We drove for like two hours to a wilderness place, up a mountain in a wilderness lake. And we parked this thing. Deborah was, of course, a great wife, watching all the kids. And I said, Deborah, please, please let me go fishing. Did I say it like that? No, I don't think I said it like that. I said, Deborah, I'm going fishing. I'm in the wilderness and I'm gonna go catch some fish. I'll be back in a little while. I didn't realize it would take me 12 hours. I started going along the side of this wilderness lake. There was no people, there was no boats, there was no canoes, there were no, what are they called, board things that people stand on nowadays. There was no nothing, not a human being in sight, nothing. I'm walking along with my fishing equipment and I'm trying to go to the streams, find a stream, find a lake so I can fish. I go for two hours more along the rim of this, of this lake and I can't find anything. And all of a sudden I see this little cove with a big rock, a giant rock like 15 feet high. And I crawled up the rock and I could look into the cove. In the cove, I'm praising God. I'm singing God all the way for two hours. I'm having a Pentecostal experience. I'm with God in the wilderness. How cool is this? I'm gonna go fishing. I crawl up on top of this rock and I look down and so help me. First thing I said, Lord, there's alligators. (laughs) Trust me, there are no alligators in the Montana wilderness. There were trout that were so big that were caught in this area like someone built a dam and they were caught in there and they were enormous, as big as my arm. I could hardly put my line in. I could put the bait on. I was shaking. I'm talking to God. I got a two pound test line and a half a pound leader and I'm going, oh my goodness, uh, they're gonna bite it and snap it immediately. What am I gonna do? I threw my bait in there. I just had to try to catch them and a first cast, Bang, this thing hits this thing. It is enormous. That's not a fish story. It was the biggest fish I had ever caught in my life. Believe me, I'm standing before God right now. He's watching me. 
It was the biggest fish I ever caught in my life. And I played with him for a while and I let him have his head and I let him wear himself out back and forth, back and forth. An hour goes by and I crawl off the rock. I finally get in a little sand beach where I slowly, inch by inch, bring him up so he doesn't snap my line. I finally get him in the water where he's close. I'm holding my line out. I get behind him in the water and I kick him right out of the water into the beach. I caught this fish. I've got a Pentecostal jig I'm doing all over the place before God. It's amazing. I get my fish and I say, oh, this is unbelievable. It's an amazing fish. It's long, it's big, big rainbow trout. And I couldn't believe it. Then I realized, oh my goodness, I've got to be back at the camp for a seven o'clock meeting. And it's like, 6.30, or no, it's like 5.30 in the afternoon, and I'm hours away from getting back. It took me two hours together. I grab the fish, and I start to run. Fishing pole in one hand, fishing equipment over the other, and I start to run with this fish. I'm running along the shore. You know, it's amazing. I'm running. And all of a sudden, I stop, and I look across this wilderness lake, There's not another human being I've seen. And there's like water flying up out of the water. It's like some kind of like a cascade coming out of the water. Finally, it gets close to me. And it's a guy in a boat. He's got one of those white boats that is a speed, speed, speed racing boat with a big giant like 409 Chevy engine in it with chrome, listen to this, chrome, no muffler whatsoever speaking, uh, going out in the air and he is ripping across this lake and he's heading towards me and I'm just baffled. I'm stopped and the guy pulls up right in front of me and he says, you want a ride? And I go, Yes, I want to ride. I got to get back. I'm two hours away. He says, hop in. I hop in. This is all the conversation I had with the guy. I hop in. He takes off. I mean, the waves are going everywhere. The wind is so hard in my face, I could hardly see anything. Tears are falling down everywhere. I'm crying like a baby. I can't see a thing. The engine's driving me nuts. The waves and water is going everywhere. Then I look at the guy and I think to myself, this guy's got to be an angel. But then I saw him. No way he could be an angel. That guy is a human mess. And besides that, he had a beer in his hand. And it was like, oh my goodness sakes alive. Look at all you men nudging your wife saying, I told you it was okay. He had a beer in his hand. Uh, and, And we shot across and I got out of the boat Thanked him, he flipped at you, <laughs> across the lake. I ran to Debbie, said, look at my fish, I'm back. She's mad at me because I've been gone for 12 hours. You know, she, she says, okay, let's go. We put the fish. I had that fish in my fridge. Nobody could eat it. It was five pounds. And I had that fish in my freezer for like years until one day Debbie threw it to the cats. Don't tell me that wasn't an angel. And guess what? He looked like a, just a mess human being. Third little story I'll tell you about real quick. My, mom, my dad died. My mom was just so dependent on my dad. They lived in Palm Desert. After about six months, mom's going to move in with us. We're taking care of her. And then we bring her up. She doesn't know how to drive. We said, you just follow us on the freeway. Don't get lost. She said, I don't know where Redlands is. Dad bought her a house in Redlands from Palm Desert. Sold the house in Palm Desert. She doesn't know how to get there. She has no idea where it's at or anything. We said, Mom, just follow us. Well, my mom, if you ever knew my mom, she's with the Lord now. She was a tall, red-headed woman, just as flaky as can be. And she just had, always had her mind somewhere else. Well, she's behind us doing just fine on the freeway. It took her a while to get on and and she maybe got on the wrong way, but she did get turned around and got back on the right way. And she's following us, and we're driving up the freeway. And she's behind us, and my engine goes, boo, 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 boo. it's running out of gas. We get as far as Calamesa, 
And my mom, I'm pulling over to the right. I'm waving at mom. She just had her head straight ahead. She's following some car to Santa Monica. You know, she had no idea where she's going. She's just in heaven. She's on the freeway. First time in her life. And she's in control. And she's just going all and oh man, what are we gonna do? I'm praying to God. I'm saying, God help me, God help me. We pull into this Calamasa bus stop or rest stop area. We pull in, there's a few cars around us. We find a spot, we pull in. What are we gonna do? There's no gas stations around here or anything. And the guy next to us in a motorhome comes up and says, what's the matter? I said, man, we're stuck. We, my mom, I told him the story. She's, she's flying down the freeway. She had no idea where she's going. He says, okay, he says, what do you need? I said, we're out of gas. He said, oh, I have gas for you. I said, but these are the, in those days, they had just converted from the big hole into the little hole. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You guys that are young don't know. You only know the little hole. There used to be a big hole there. And then there's a little hole. I said, but this got a little hole in it. It doesn't have a big hole. He says, no problem, man. I got it all covered. Filled me up with gas, started it up, chased after my mom, went to the house, didn't know where she was at. She was there waiting for us. How she got there, I have no idea. The guy in the motor home was an angel and someone got her to the house. Come on, come on, somebody. In your life, it's the same way. You're looking at people waiting to find something out of, you know, a John Travolta looking human being with white wings and uh, it isn't going to happen. You need to realize that some of the scrubbiest people in the world, strange errs, and that's what the verse says, entertain those strangers with love because you never know if they're angels. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord, give me praise.